Hey folks, if you are watching this video, I, I didn't pull it off on the first take. This is about take uh, 12. Um, I haven't been crying. I've been coughing. I'm getting over a cold and I was fine, but um, I know now I've been having coughing fits. I'm Sasan from uh, Proteus Debate Academy. If you don't know what those things are, here's a little bit of information explaining that. Um, you know, one other disclaimer, other than the fact that this is gonna be my last take. If I if I can't get through this one, I'm just I'm just gonna record it another day, which means there's a very real chance this doesn't come out. There's like four or five videos that I've like started recording, made it like ten takes into, and then been like forget it, and just never gone back to. Um, one day. Um, no, the other disclaimer is that my regular camera isn't working, and whatever it that doesn't matter that like the resolution's a little different what matters is i keep gesturing and it's like not mirrored and i hate it and um that's okay what are we like 10 minutes into this video already i want to talk about logic in debate um which depending on how much you know about debate how much you know about logic may or may not be what you expect this video to be about. Um, I got asked a question on our, um, on one of our YouTube videos, this one. It's um, button responses. Button responses are an acronym that I came up with for um, six ways of responding to arguments in debate. Um, I will explain all of that a lot more as I answer this question, but um, that is to just give you a little bit of context for what the question's about. But I want, part of this video is answering the question I got asked. Um, but most of this video is really talking about what's going on underneath that answer, like understanding that answer, which requires, which requires understanding how logic intersects with debate. Um, so th th this is a couple of the questions I got on that, uh, I think maybe the two questions I got on that video, but you can see I, I, I give pretty long-winded answers, um, but this was getting extra long-winded. I got this far and I was like, I'm not even close to saying everything I want to say about this, so I'm just going to make a video. Um, one other video, if you're going to watch other things as like a companion piece to this, you might want to watch the advantage structure video if you don't know what that is. I'm going to, I think everything you need to know to understand this video is in the video itself. But if you're curious to know more about these things, we have videos. <sighs> so um, let's get started. Uh, what is logic? Logic is the relationship between ideas. Um, it's, we use the word logic in everyday conversation as sort of just a, another word meaning smart, but that's not really what it is, right? So let's say I told you that, um, I am 32 years old, which I am, uh, you knowing that isn't logic and it's not, I mean, it might be smart. Uh, especially if you knew like a lot of people's ages, if you knew everyone on Earth's age, um, yeah, you, you'd be really smart, but it wouldn't be an exercise in logic, right? If I told you, man, is that actually, I was about to say Paul is two years younger than me. I think it's a year and a half, um, uh, ish. So yeah, if I told you like the difference in age between Paul and I, you knowing the difference in age between Paul and I is not logic either, right? What is logic is you being able to extrapolate how old Paul is by knowing how old I am and what our age difference is, right? It's combining those two ideas and um, using that to draw a new conclusion. I think Paul's 31? I don't know, 30? 31? I don't remember. Sorry, Paul. Um, <laughs> if I told you uh, Paul's a year younger than me and you figured out that he, that must mean he's 31, that is logic. Because I never told you Paul is 31 in this hypothetical scenario. 
So it's the relationship between those ideas and the conclusions you can draw from it, which we're referring to when, um, when we talk about logic. And here, like ideas, claims, same thing. Don't worry about that. Um, I studied uh, philosophy in college to the degree that I went to college. And to the degree that I studied in college, it was a lot of philosophy. Um, and in philosophy, in particularly like the, you know, the roots of like ancient Greek philosophy, you get a lot of uh, what are called syllogisms. And that is basically what arguments are. It, it, is, it is the foundation of argumentation. And what that is, is taking a bunch of premises, uh, a bunch of claims, and then combining them to draw new conclusions like we were just talking about. They're just written out and organized um, in a particular way. So the most famous one that everybody gets taught is all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Now, the claim, each claim can be true or it can be false, right? But... Um, that's a different question from whether the logic of the argument works. And a lot of people think that debate, when they're starting out or if they're not that familiar with debate, they expect debate to be a, about like showing that your opponent's arguments are false. But that's not really what, I mean, you'd have to be a really bad debater to be going into rounds and just saying things that are easily demonstrably false, right? Like that just doesn't happen. People have Google. They, really, you challenge your opponent's logic a lot more than you challenge like whether an individual claim is true or false. Um, so, so the conclusion, right? When we say like, therefore Socrates is mortal, we don't describe in philosophy terms, we don't describe a conclusion as true or false. We describe it as valid or invalid and we also describe it as sound and unsound. Now what sound means is that, yeah, all, all parts of this claim are, are true. But when we say valid or invalid, that is really the bigger concern, and I'll explain why. Um, valid just means that the, the math here checks out, right? Um, like if I said Socrates is a dog, and all dogs are born in November, therefore Socrates was bo born in November, that would be a valid argument, right? It wouldn't be a sound argument because the premises aren't true, but the math checks out, right? So that is what we're talking about when we're talking about logic. Um, this is not Socrates. This might be Aristotle. This might be Plato's face. I don't remember who I looked up. I'm going to use them interchangeably. Um, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bad philosophy student. But here's an interesting thing, and this is true. Uh, Aristotle thought that men had more teeth than women. Um, what a moron, right? Like, just count, bro. Um, but that, one, must not have been that easy back in the day because um, teeth, teeth are modern dentistry has done people a lot of favors. The other aspect of it is just the notion that if you want to know if something is true, you should check is a shockingly new notion that we did not used to have and was not the common um, Western mode of thought uh, at around the time of Aristotle. Um, that idea is what we call empiricism. <coughs> oh, man. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'll give you a second to read this really funny comic from a couple days ago. <clears throat> empiricism is the idea that if you want to know if something's true, you should check. Um, it became a lot more popular when things became more possible to check right? Um, but it's a shockingly recent development. And basically, every form of science, at least, 
like real science, right? Like, I don't know if this applies to like political science, um, but all the hard sciences today are rooted in empiricism to the point where some might think that like that like science just means empiricism, right? And maybe it does. Um, but uh, there's problems with empiricism that people don't um, really think about much. Well, the the first problem with empiricism is that if you want to check something, you can only check the way something is now, right? That's one limit. It's not a problem necessarily, but that's a limitation, right? Um, there's evidence of the past, I guess, but like, not really, right? Like, yeah, we know that there were pyramids in ancient Egypt because we know that there's pyramids there now, and we have sophisticated ways of extrapolating how old something is or a historical record or whatever, but all of those are things we're looking at in the present. You can't examine the past. You can't examine the future, right? All you can look at is right now, which is a limit of empiricism, which it, I don't know if it does or doesn't apply to other models of thought. Um, the other problem with empiricism is that you can't use empiricism to explain why empiricism is good, right? Like it's, like you can't like go check the idea that checking things is what you should do. Um, you always have to start with some like foundational idea and then build on top of that. The other problem is that you don't always know all the parts of an argument that you should check. Right. You don't you're you're always making assumptions and that's what I'm going to talk about. Right. But you, but you never know all of the assumptions that you're making. And if you have to go find direct proof for all of the assumptions uh, in uh, in a in an argument, then it's an impossible burden. Right. It, it's really difficult to empirically prove something Um the same way that we can mathematically prove something, right? It, like, it's really, really difficult to prove um, what's at the core of the Earth uh, compared to proving um, the value of the first six digits of pi, right? Um, and it's actually way worse than just, like, what's at the core of the Earth. So this is Rene Descartes, who... I realized after I made this uh, looks exactly like Peter Sellers. That's Peter. Oh, my God. Look at that. That is Peter Sellers. He was an actor. He was in uh, famously the Pink Panther. He was also in uh, Dr. Strangelove. But okay. Rene Descartes was a French philosopher, and he sat down one day, and he decided, all right, um, I know I'm making certain assumptions, right? Um, but there must be things that I can prove that don't rely on any assumptions, right? That, that I can, that I, that I have proof for, and there's no assumptions that I'm making at all. And he sat down with a piece of paper and he tried to reason through it. And, uh, he basically lost his mind. He had a mental breakdown because for every idea that he tried to think of, he would realize that there were assumptions he was making or or in other words um possible things that would disprove that thought right he'd be like okay uh i'm sitting in a room oh well i guess i could be dreaming and not know it like how can you how do you know you're not dreaming right and 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 the other aspect is look how do you know you're not dreaming how do you know that what you remember from two seconds ago is accurate how do you know that what your eyes are seeing is accurate, right? Like you, all of these are assumptions with no basis. Basically lost his mind until he finally had the idea that, okay, I don't know if any of my thoughts are accurate, but I know thoughts are happening. And he got, he, he, he got to a point where he doubted his own existence. Um, but he came to the conclusion, all right, if, if, uh, if thoughts exist 
and they do because I'm thinking them, right? Because that's the only thing I know is that some thoughts are happening. Something must be having those thoughts, and I'm just going to call that thing that is having the thoughts me. So if thoughts exist, then I must exist. And that is what I think, therefore, I am actually means. It doesn't mean knowledge is power. It means that the existence of thoughts is... Um, is proof that you, the person having that thought, exists. Why does that matter? It doesn't. It, it, that's not a terribly interesting thing. The only thing interesting about it is, is the only thing that... It, 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 people since then have pointed out that there's still some assumptions being made, but it is the only thing that Rene Descartes could um, conclude without making other assumptions. My point being that every other thing that you want to prove in the world is reliant on assumptions. Implicit assumption means it's an assumption that you don't even know. It's like a, a, an implicit premise is is a, a assumption you're making that you don't even know you're making, right? It's, it's like assuming you're awake, assuming that you remember things accurately. These are all implicit premises, right? And it's impossible to prove all of the implicit premises that any argument would really need in order to be proven accurate this is this is logic this is how this is just an intro to what logic is right great and i already mentioned this but let's get into it like debate even though it's like impossible to fully prove that whatever that's not what debate's about we usually don't even challenge each other's evidence very much at all, right? We we make assumptions all the time. We assume debaters are not lying about 95% of the things that they say. We take it at face value and then we say, okay, if that is true, right, does it mathematically follow that this conclusion that you are making, uh, it, like, is that valid, right? Um, and that is the only thing that you need to know about logic in order to get into the rest of this. But it, 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 I want to say another thing in defense of um, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. Um, yeah, they didn't know that um, women had the same number of teeth as men. But uh, they did know that atoms existed uh, thousands of years before it was proved. Like, like. Like the 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 atom was proven to exist like a hundred years ago, and the word atom comes from Greek two and a half thousand years ago. Now, the reason they concluded that atoms must exist is they figured there must be something that isn't made out of other things. Like for. Like, for it to not just go infinitely smaller, there has to be a basic building block everything else is made out of. They called that an atom. Turns out atoms aren't that. Turns out atoms are made of stuff. There are things that aren't made out of other things. Um, but but the point is that uh, you can conclude things, but you're still usually wrong. Um, we're probably wrong about most things. Uh, you can consult Nietzsche on that uh, later. Okay. So... Let's get into answering the actual question. Uh, hopefully, this is all time stamped, so you could just jump straight to this if you wanted. Hello, people who jumped straight to this. The question is: Is there a similar framework for counter arguments and value and fact rounds? And in order to answer that, I need to explain what a value and a fact round is, um, and what like argument logic is. So this is. Um, Toolman? What, what was your first name? Tom, Tom, Thomas? John, John? John? Jimmy? I don't remember. Dr. Toolman came up with um, the Toolman model, which is what all of you got taught argumentation is. It's a claim, warn, and an impact. And um, the hill that I would die on is that that is a useless... It's like, like that's a useless like like distinction in debate. Like it's it's not it's not useful. It doesn't like like be teaching people to claim more an impact doesn't tell them anything about how to structure their arguments. But whatever. Um, 
that is the Toolman model. That that is how fact and value uh, fact and value arguments work, right? Um, button d doesn't respond to this. When I'm talking about like button is the logical problems that might exist in an argument, those are are talking about um, policy rounds, and in those we have advantage structure, which unlike the Toolman model tells you what a section of your argument should be saying or must say in order for the for the conclusion to be valid right so what toolman says is that for your for your argument to be valid you need to be making an argument about something okay and then you need like a reason why you think that's true doesn't tell us what that reason needs to be or what qualities that reason needs to have and then you need to explain why that's important but we also don't know like what the metrics for measuring that are or like determining if the argument's good or not in an advantage you are making an argument in a policy round let's say a policy round is about whether or not we should take an action and if you are saying we should take an action what you're saying is the world after taking that action will be better than it is now and better than a world in which we don't take that action like better than the future of not taking that action so there are logical things that you must prove in order for that to be logically valid right you have to express something in the status quo explain what your action is talk about how the thing you want to do affects the situation in the status quo and then show that the change that you are talking about is beneficial, right? Um, that's not, I mean, these words are words that somebody sat down and came up with, right? <coughs> the words uniqueness link and internal link are words that somebody sat down, came up with and said, we should use these in debate. And might I say, they did a terrible job. These are awful names. <laughs> They're really confusing. Link, internal link, uniqueness, super confusing. They should have thought of way different, better names, but they are the norms now, right? But the actual logic here isn't invented by somebody. It's, it's almost discovered uh, the way like a mathematical relationship between two things is discovered, right? Uh, in, in, in the way that pi is discovered, right? Pi isn't, an, isn't a number somebody just decided to come up with. It's, okay, circles have a length uh, of diameter. They have a length of radius. And if you compare those lengths, the relationship between those is inherent and it, it always is a certain way. Similar to debate, if you want to argue that taking an action will improve the status quo, your argument, if it fails at any of these four parts, is invalid. And this isn't a decision that somebody made or something someone gets to change. It's something that we learn through analysis. Now, this isn't different than the Toolman model. It's just a much more specific application. In fact, all of these parts have claims and warrants. You would use evidence for nearly all parts of um, this. So this is why I'm saying, like, just saying that an argument needs a claim and a warrant, like, that, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain what those arguments should be. And if there's a screen cap in there, sorry, in, oh, my God, in there of our advantage structure video and explains, like, there's sub parts and sub claims, and you would want to try to prove that each of those claims is true. But what makes the argument valid is the relationship between the uniqueness, the link, the internal link, and the impacts, right? And what button responses are as counter arguments is not like here is why your evidence is wrong, but here are the ways in which the relationship between these parts of an argument can be wrong so that you learn to look for it and point it out. So what are fact 
resolutions, what are value resolutions, and how how does that change things? That is that is you've now caught up to the button video. Let's get into what you need to understand for the question being asked. Um, fact resolutions are resolutions where we get asked to evaluate something, right? And specifically, there is a correct way of evaluating it. There isn't that it, that it's not really up for debate what it is that we're trying to measure or what it is that we're trying to evaluate. For example, Trump will win the 2024 presidential election. How will you know he won if if just it meets the criteria that exists for winning an election? Um, I guess that is a famously bad <laughs> example to use. Um, but we also have value resolutions, which are really similar, but they don't tell us how to measure the thing that we're evaluating. For example, it would be, oh man, I forgot to change that bottom one. That bottom one should say, um, Trump was a good president. Well, what defines a good president, right? How do we know if somebody's a good president? That is something that we can debate about. And so the, the, the way that they work differently is in a fact round, is just claim more an impact and you're just finding evidence. And the winner is decided by the preponderance of evidence, who has the most or best evidence supporting their side. Um, this is why fact debates um, are rare in most serious formats of debate because it's not very interesting. It's just digging up evidence and just reading evidence to each other, and you don't have to interact with each other. And the only way you could really interact with each other in a meaningful way is to disprove each other's evidence, which I've talked about in many different videos, is not something debate is good at doing. Like, if you wanted, like, like when we have scientific papers, the way we check if the claims inside are true is not to give two children time limits and have them argue it out. Like, that's just not an effective way of testing the the quality of evidence in an argument. But we'll talk more about what I dislike about fact rounds in a minute. Uh, the way value rounds are a little different and a little bit more interesting is now there's another layer to the debate, which is um, arguing over what we should be evaluating, right? So it's not just was Trump a good president, it's what is a good president, right? And the judge has to first decide which value or which like metric for picking the winner they're going to use then they apply that metric to the arguments and there's a lot more nuance and a lot more um debating to be done in talking about what that value should be and i think value debates are um a great format a great a great uh kind of resolution it's not a format exactly um, they exist within many different formats. Um, and the only difference in the structure of a value argument from a fact argument is that your value argument should probably also include a link to the value, right? So you're talking about here is this thing that I think we should be adhering to. It's probably useful in every argument to explain how you're adhering to that thing you told us to, you would adhere to. Okay. Um, is this the part where I, oh, okay, yeah. So so what is the answer to this question, right? Is there a similar framework for counter arguments, like button, do we have the like six stuff for fact and value rounds? And the answer to that is no, because the logic that button arguments work under is different than the logic that, um, fact value rounds work under and in fact fact value arguments don't really have that much logic in them for something like a the button responses to exist it's just a series of claims that might be true or might not be true that's a little less the case for um value debate but in value debates you would really only have whether the argument links uh to um 
to the value. The n in button is no link, so I guess that one would apply. And then you would have O is for outweigh, like outweighing on impacts. You would probably also have that. But things like, you know, non-unique, like link turns, stuff like that, uh, not really, we're not talking about a before after scenario, right? We're not talking about like, this is the status quo, this is the change that would happen if we're talking about was Trump a good president. Um, but the more, com I probably could have made that answer in a long comment, but but there's, there's, a, there's a little bit more to it, which is that, okay, sometimes the answer is yes. And the reason for that is because the line between how um, fact and value debates are had and how policy debates are had is a lot blurrier than my earlier description of what those rounds are and how they're different from each other. And the reason for that is because everyone but me is wrong and they should tell me they're sorry. Um, I coached a community college um, debate team for like 10 years. Um, the 2022 season, 2021 to 2022 was my last season coaching there. We were the top debate team in the top community college debate team in the country. Go Vikings. Paul is still there. He's coaching. And uh, that year, the national championships, we, I think um, – mainly mainly Paul, um, wrote this proposal. And if you've never been to a debate, um, like a speech and debate, like business meeting, they are wild. It's a it's, it's hundred people in the same room and they're all angry and they all want to leave and they all like have these opinions and they're all like former debaters and former speech people. It's one of the funniest and most terrible experiences uh, you can have. So we proposed this thing, right? So that the national championships for community college debate, they used to have um, five resolutions, uh, two policy, two uh, in, in parliamentary debate, two policy resolutions, two value resolutions, two, and, and then one um, metaphor. And the, one of the big things we were trying to accomplish here is that metaphor rounds are awful. I won't even bother explaining what they are because we kind of succeeded and they don't exist anymore. Um, but one of the really annoying things about uh, these business meetings is you have a committee of the uh, – you have a debate committee, right? You have like, hey, everybody who really cares about debate rules, come to this debate committee meeting. We're going to meet for three hours and talk about these rules, right? So we go in the committee meeting. And we're like, hey, folks, we all talked about it, and we think this is what we should do. And then a bunch of people who've never done debate and who just like do, go to nationals once every five years, and they bring three kids, and their kids like all lose, and I end up having to coach them in the hallways instead of their coaches – um, I'm sorry. There's a lot of like venom coming out here, but I think this, this stuff is just so annoying. And these, these meetings were so toxic. <laughs> I had people like, like follow me into the bathroom and like threaten me, uh, for, for being like, Hey, I think metaphor rounds are bad. And you're like, you're the reason why debate is dying. Um, but anyway, this is the rule that they actually changed it to after that meeting, and that was that, okay, now there's going to be two policy, two value, and one fact. I didn't like that because, like I said, fact rounds aren't good and not very interesting. But what does that have to do with the asterisk that I mentioned earlier, right? Like, what does that have to do with whether button responses work in value rounds or fact rounds? And, and the answer to that is these same people – are the ones who are writing the debate topics. And they don't know what a fact round is and don't know what a value round is. And and that's okay. Like, nobody expects them to. You shouldn't have to do 10, 15 years of debate uh, and be, like, a very good debater in order for you to be able to serve your community and to, like, help run tournaments and stuff, right? Um, but... Uh, at least it's stuff like this. So here are, I looked up, because I'm this petty, uh, when I was making this video, I looked up some of the rounds of 
the tournament that happened the year after I left when they had to implement this, right? So remember, there's supposed to be two policy, two value, and one fact. Well, what do we got? Here's round one. Uh, the first two rounds are policy resolutions. They're, they're the U.S. taking an action, South Korea taking an action. This hack, this house regrets the creation of NATO. Now, that could be a value, I guess. Um, like, it, 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 I mean, it, it's, it's kind of like... It's a fact resolution if the debate is about whether or not someone does regret it, right? Like if like if I'm the AF and I get to if I get to dis define who this house is, and I say like the United States regrets it, uh, does that mean that I win? Or does the negative say that is what you have to prove in order to win? Um, it gets really messy. Um, Economic ties to Latin American nations are key to the U.S. solving the Western Hemisphere's migrant crisis. Like, what, are, what is the value that I'm supposed to bring into this, right? Like, solving the migrant crisis isn't this vague notion like, oh, well, what, is a, what does it mean to be a good president? I think we can pretty much agree whether a migrant crisis is happening or not. Maybe we can't. I don't know. Doesn't seem super, um, you know consistent but like that's like okay that's whether it's a fact or value right um that shouldn't really affect things uh that much um here's another bit where i'm just complaining that fact rounds are bad cities controlled by the left have more crime than those controlled by the right how is that a debate like i don't know what the answer is but i'm sure if i googled it and found a snopes article the debate would basically be over like one side wins or the like what metric is there other than crime statistics and then just measuring that thing? Like if, if this is round, this is a national championship, right? Like if I just get side, like you don't get to choose your side. If I just get assigned the losing side, like, and that is why they have five topics, right? That they're like, well, you could just strike that topic. We'll write bad topics and then you can just choose not to debate it, um, which is uh, frustrating to me. But this one... <laughs> Like, offering a high school vocational educational, sorry, offering a high school vocational education track would be desirable. That just is a policy round. Like, just because you didn't say the words, the United States federal government should offer a high school vocational track, doesn't mean that the logic of the arguments proving the statement don't function in the same way as if you had just said the word should, right? And that and that is kind of the bigger point that I'm trying to get at is when you ask people like, what is a policy round? They'll give you an answer like, oh, uh, policy rounds are the ones that say should in them. Like that's not what makes a policy round a policy round, right? In this third resolution here, you are making a, your argument, the logic of your arguments is saying, here is what the situation looks like right now. This is what it would be like if we offered this track and that would be better or that would be worse. That is a policy round, right? And so even though this is called value, yes, button responses will work here. And it doesn't matter if your opponent calls their argument an advantage and calls their statement about the status quo the uniqueness or not, right? It is a uniqueness and a non-unique answer will respond to it just as well. And if their response to it is non-unique, like that's, that's not like you can't use non-unique in this kind of round like it, that is a fundamental misunderstanding of how logic and debate works and that is a really common thing right we get used to what things are called and how things are categorized and we don't think about like what is the logic of this argument and what is the logic of this response and um so not only is like logic the, the the answer of why button responses don't work in uh 
fact value rounds, but it's also the reason why they do, right? And it, it just, the, the answer is what a fact value round is in practice is really inconsistent and people don't have, um, I don't know. They just don't, they just say things. And so your job is to figure out what the logic of the argument you're responding to is and then determine whether the logic of the button responses applies to the logic of the claims being made. And unfortunately, it's not as simple as me just telling you, oh, like in the ones labeled fact and value, these responses don't apply. What's on the next slide? Oh, great. It's everything that I just said. Um, cool. But there's um, other stuff. Since we're already talking about um, logic, I wanted to include, I think these are all just one slide each, just a couple other aspects of how, like, thinking about logic in a debate round uh, helps. So the, the first way of applying uh, logic is thinking of implicit premises, like looking for implicit premises in your opponent's arguments, right? Um, so thinking about like what assumptions are they relying on that they might not be able to defend or understand or substantiate. And, and, and the time that that is the most effective uh, is in cross-examination because it will be obvious to your judge why the question you're asking is relevant because it is a premise, right? If you demonstrate that, oh, okay, so your conclusion relies on this premise being true. Can you show that it is? And you're just looking for things that they don't have evidence for. And that just makes for um, just effective cross-examination. Um, I, I talk about this a lot more and in fact, logic and stuff like that in um, our cross-examination video. Um, that's like an hour and a half long, um, but I go into all of this. The other uh, importance of logic is logic is like, it's not like I talked about advantage structure and how the logic of that works. There's every argument in debate, every concept in debate must justify its own logic, right? Debate is not a game with a rule book like you, you, you watching this uh, a, a coach or a student are taught debate in the context of like this is an advantage and this is what it has this is a, a counter plan and this is what it has but those things aren't written anywhere it's just for those arguments to be valid, they must include these things. And understanding the actual logic of why they must include those things. What, what function does each premise serve in drawing that conclusion is so critical to being able to debate something, right? Being able to give a counter plan and being able to debate a counter plan, the difference between those is understanding the logical function of each part of the counter plan and therefore being able to find a flaw and explain how that takes the whole thing apart, right? And that, that, that's also things that like, like do teams need to disclose in debate? It's not a rule, right? What determines whether an affirmative team needs to disclose their case on a wiki or whatever is logical premises that we agree on and then the implications of those logical premises, the logical, uh, in, like the logical conclusions we draw from uh, those logical premises. And, and you can disagree with some people's premises, but really the most effective way is saying, ah, you agree with all of these things. Well, if you agree with all of these things, then 
what you're saying can't be true. Like that that is what theory debate is. Like like when you are in a debate round, every theory argument, every theory argument ever read, the voters are fairness and education. What that means is the purpose, the the way you measure whether you vote for this argument or not is whether it increases uh, fairness and whether it increases education. We usually don't argue about that. What we do argue about is how fairness and education interact with the things we're talking about. And that is a logical relationship between something that happened in the round and whether that thing is fair or good for debate or whatever, right? And understanding the logic and thinking about these things in terms of logic um, is really important to being able to do um, debate at a intermediate to advanced level but also that is why like debate styles change and I don't just mean like people didn't used to talk so fast and now they talk faster I mean like people used to read stock issues you don't know what that is uh, because by the time I was getting taught stock issues, like I got taught stock issues by people who debated in the 90s and early 2000s. I debated in like the very early like 2010s and people were like not really using it anymore. Um, the more kind of like national circuity they were, um, the, the less they used it. And now um, it's pretty rare. I, d I don't know that like high school students in debate are taught stock issues um and some people say like that is bad but others would argue that like the logical premises of why stock issues are required in debate has been um sufficiently challenged right so the bigger point here is that in like every debate round every debate round is a conversation about all debate rounds and how debate works and how it should work. And um, that's actually a really fun and really cool thing about debate. And, 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 and the people who get the most into like theory debate, like that's what they enjoy about it. Because it's not just having, you know, one debate with one team. You're kind of this discussing this whole fascinating interplay between all these ideas um, all the time. And the third reason why logic is important is you use it to make your own rules. That's what I liked the most. Um, like with the button responses, like I came up with the acronym for button but it's not like I was the first person to think of the, like in in fact a lot of the words that make up button are words that I was taught right. But the other aspect of it is that like I can say these are the six ways that an argument can be logically wrong, and teach it to people because I understood the logic of it, or I, or, I, or, or I felt confident in my understanding of the logic of it. And I said, well, if that is true, then these other things must be true. And I'm going to work with that. And I'm going to work with that until I start losing. And, and, and somebody tells me, like, I, I, I find out that I was wrong. And that's a really appealing thing to me, right? Like I <laughs> had a lot of issues with authority. Um, and so just being able to say, like, no, like, the logic justifies itself. The logic of my arguments justify themselves. And if you disagree with them, you have to find a logical flaw, um, I think is a, a really um, powerful concept uh, and something that I that really resonated with me about debate and 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 my debate coach uh tony um wasn't the only debate coach i ever had but um was was the one that i'd spent the most time working with and tony like 
was a was a decent debater, uh, but he wasn't that good. Um, he was very funny. He, he, <laughs> he <laughs> I was talking to his old debate partner uh, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me stories that like. Yeah, Tony would just turn to me at the start of a debate round and be like, yeah, we're not going to win this one. And then they would uh, just try to clown on the other uh, debaters, which I don't recommend. Um, but but my point there being that, like, he – the way I learned debate was I just thought about it. I just – I thought about it really hard. I talked to people about it, and I thought, well, if these things are true, then shouldn't this thing also be true? And then I tried that, and some of the time it worked. And then I taught that to the kids that I worked with. And they did it, and it kept working. And that's how our team got really good. And that is how, you know, a, a, a small community college team with, like, I think DVC had a speech and debate team uh, for about 60 years before I was on it. Um and I wasn't historically like the most successful person on our team. Um, I don't think, um, but I think the, like using like natural national rankings, like the, the highest a DVC debater had ever been ranked before, um, that sort of era was like 70th in the country. And, you know, like within like five, six years, we had like the 22nd, 16th, 14th best debaters in the country, right? Um, I think maybe even higher than that sometimes. I don't know. I, I stopped keeping track of that stuff. Or if I did, I just didn't remember it. But I, I, I think that is really the great equalizer because nobody determines what makes the rules of debate like if you can justify something logically or find the logical problem in something you just go in there and you make that point and if you're able to express those ideas effectively you'll win it'll work and this is also what checks back against like Schools with high resources, giving somebody a script and just telling them to go say something, and then they win a lot of stuff, right? Like, a lot of debaters who you think are very, very good at debate have a poor logical understanding of debate. They know how to read a critique, but they don't understand how the logic of their critique works, and they don't, they can't defend their argument even if the lo if even if the argument isn't logically flawed like they can't defend attacks against the logic and um i think that is a a, a hugely overlooked aspect of debate um yeah i don't know i think i am done it got a little rambly at the end there um and i feel like I might be leaving you with a lot more questions than I'm answering, but um, I don't know. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you should ask those questions so that I make the videos more often. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's it. All right. Thanks, folks.